Okay, um, so one other type of substance that also has metallic bonding in it, um, obviously most commonly we see metals that are just by themselves. So any metal you see on the periodic table, gold, silver, zinc, iron, um, whenever they're by themselves, they always have metallic bonding. Another common uh, type of substance is actually a mixture. So not a compound, but a mixture of two or more elements called an alloy. All right, And as long as one of them is a metal, then we still consider it an alloy. You may have heard this word before, um, but even if you haven't, you've probably heard some examples of alloys before. All right. Usually it's a mixture of multiple metals, but it doesn't have to be. As long as one of them is a metal, it's still considered an alloy. And it's really important to remember, it is a mixture. All right. They're going to be bonded based on metallic bonds. That is true. All right. Um, but in terms of a chemical formula for something like this, we would just name off the two elements. So it'd be like a mixture or an alloy of nickel and copper. It would just say something like nickel and copper. All right, nothing fancy. There wouldn't be like a chemical formula for this. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind. This is literally just a mixture of two elements together. All right, some examples, if you aren't sure if you've heard of these, this is anything you've heard of that is definitely metallic, all right, definitely looks like a metal, so it has some of those properties like it's shiny, it's hard, it's durable, things like that, um, but isn't on the periodic table. So maybe take a second, try and think if you know of any. If you think of, uh, for example, the Olympics, right? We have this, the gold medal, the silver medal. Gold and silver are both on the periodic table. But what's that third one? Bronze, all right? Bronze. Bronze isn't on the periodic table. So bronze, even though it looks like a metal, is actually a mixture of multiple ones, all right? Um, things like jewelry, all right? Maybe some of you can afford jewelry that's made out of a pure metal. But I know, at least for me, I'm going to have to have jewelry that's made out of things like sterling silver, all right? Not pure silver, but a mixture of um, multiple things that make up sterling silver, all right? Um, other examples, any of you who are in band, who play a brass instrument, all right? Brass is not on the periodic table, but it is metallic, so this is actually an example of an alloy. There are many examples, all right? And you don't need to know them. You don't need to memorize what metals are in each of these. All right, but these are just some examples, all right, so that you know you've heard of them, you've seen them before, um, you maybe just didn't realize what they were at the time, all right. Other examples are things like stainless steel or steel itself, all right, is an example of an alloy. Anything that you know of that is definitely metallic looking but just isn't on the periodic table, all right. All of our money that we use is uh, made of alloys, all right, so things like our pennies, copper and nickel. All right, all of the ones like our nickels and our dimes, um, our quarters that look kind of silver um, are actually aluminum alloys, so aluminum mixed with something else. All right, so you know a lot of examples. The more important thing, what I want you to know for your test, all right, is why are they important? So why do we care about them? Why do we make them? Why do they exist? All right, and looking at that list, you may already kind of have an idea for me. I know, I buy sterling silver jewelry because it's cheaper, all right? So that is a reason you can make things that are cheaper. Our coins kind of the same thing. We don't want the coin itself to be worth more uh, than what its value should be. So we make it into an alloy so it's cheaper, all right? But chemically, what you should care about more for this class, all right, is that its properties, so its physical properties, are superior to each element individually. All right? That's usually the reason why the alloy exists. All right? So it's harder, it's more durable. Even though metals are already pretty durable, an alloy is usually even better. All right? Or, um, you know, so that's definitely some examples. All right? um, or if you have something like stainless steel, all right? or sterling silver, things that don't tarnish, don't rust, all right? We call that being corrosion resistant. So they won't rust um, or tarnish, all right? They won't get kind of that ugly coloring to them, all right? Not always, but that's what some alloys are capable of doing, all right? Easier to cast in molds, so it's easier to shape them or make a design on them, all right? 
somehow they are better than each of the elements by themselves. All right, so that's why they're important. There are two different types of alloys, all right, that you need to know for a future quiz, future test, all right? So there are two types of alloys. The first one is substitutional. The second is interstitial. So again, take a second, write that down. We're going to draw some pictures of them first, and then we'll go ahead and throw up how you tell the difference. All right, I think, again, being a visual learner, seeing the pictures is a lot easier, all right? <coughs> all right, for a substitutional alloy, all right, again, remember, this is a metal. Uh, even though it's a mixture of metals, it still is metallic bonding. So we're going to have our atoms organized in kind of rows and columns. For a substitutional alloy, it kind of sounds like what it is. You substitute one metal atom for another, all right? So when you mix the two together, we have the same kind of structure, same rows and columns, but you replace some of them with atoms of the new element. So they get mixed in there. Usually it's a homogeneous mixture, so there's some kind of pattern to it. All right, so you mix them in so that you have the new metal kind of taking the place of the old metal in the structure. All right, this happens uh, exclusively when they are very similar in size. So if you have two metals mixed together that are really close to the same size, so same number of energy levels, same kind of similar masses, all right, so when you have relatively the same size atoms, they're just going to replace one another. So literally substitute one in for the other. Okay, interstitial then, all right, you might be able to guess when this happens. So when they're different sizes, all right, we're going to again start with that main structure. All right, so we have our original metal atoms the way they used to be, all right. And then let's say that the other metal or the other element that we're mixing with it is uh, smaller, all right? So we have the big metal atoms, and then let's say we have something small like carbon or something we want to mix in with it, all right? In an interstitial alloy, the smaller atoms kind of, instead of replacing the old ones, they just fit into the little gaps in the structure, the little nooks and crannies that are kind of in the structure um, already. So rather than replacing one of the atoms, they just kind of fill in the gaps. All right. So this is usually going to lead to it being a lot more durable because there's not as much wiggle room. All right. So an interstitial alloy, the components are very different sizes. So you have ones that are really big and ones that are very small so that you can kind of fit in the little gaps in between. All right. Um, and so again, the smaller ones are going to kind of fill in the space between the larger atoms. All right, so here in a second, you guys are going to watch some videos about alloys, some different uses of them to kind of solidify this. Um, but you're also going to be asked to kind of use what you see um, to determine, you know, what type of alloy something is um, and what some of the, the purposes are of making it one way versus another. All right, so go ahead and start the videos for your homework. Um, and I will see you all soon.